Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. This is Liz Boswell from Waste 360 with Emily Broadley, clinical professor at Harvard Law School and director of Harvard Law School's Food Law and Policy Clinic. Hi, Emily, and thanks for being on the show today. Hi, thanks for having me. So, Emily, we normally start in the beginning, so please tell us a little bit about your background and how you found your way to the world of food law. Yeah, um, well, so um, my, I'll tell you first that what the Food Law and Policy Clinic does, which is that we're a um, service learning program at Harvard Law School, which means that we, the service component is that we provide, uh, we, we work with clients who are either nonprofits, businesses, government agencies, on trying to either better understand the laws around a food issue or to strengthen those laws. And we have students involved in learning about this and in every aspect of the work so that they are able to then go out and continue working in this field. Um, my clinic's the first clinic in the country that focuses solely on food law and policy, although there are now several peer clinics. Um, so my, my, the way that I found my, myself in this work was that uh, I spent some time after law school working on the ground in rural Mississippi, and I got really interested in um, questions that were coming up about how you know, food access challenges in the community, and then also uh, burgeoning kind of local food movement and a lot of food producers really wanting to understand the laws about selling their food. And I realized that this is just such an interesting area that impacts so much of our daily life, it impacts the you know workers in the food system, consumers, the environment. Um, so all to say that this has been um, it's it's a really fun and great area to work in. Well, that's amazing. And what an accomplishment. Um, you know, you were the one that launched the first law school clinic, right? Yep. How has that changed um, since the initial launch? Has it become what you dreamt it would be? That's a really that's actually a hard question to answer. In the beginning, I think you know I didn't know I didn't know all that was possible. So I, I guess the answer is that it's exceeded my dreams. And, um, you know, for a while, the clinic was, was just me and a bunch of really dedicated students. And now we have such an amazing team of, um, there are four other attorneys on the team. Um, we, you know, have some kind of administrative staff who do awesome work with communications, et cetera. Um, and I think some of the other changes, one of our biggest areas now, which I know we'll talk about is around reducing food waste and, and supporting food recovery. Um, that wasn't on my radar at the very start of the clinic. So that's been a really fascinating area to dig into. And then also we've been doing more federal work early on. I was very focused on state and local food laws. Um, and then I've gotten to do more federal work. And just in the past few years, we've been doing a lot more global work and um, kind of realizing and recognizing that we have so much to learn from other countries that we have things to share. And then also our food is in such a global system that, um, you know, really focusing only domestically misses a lot of that important picture. So it's been growing in all these different ways and uh, that I couldn't have predicted at the beginning. Oh, that's amazing. And so let's talk COVID-19. I mean, you've shared so much great knowledge around how the global pandemic has affected the food system and, and of course, the people who are most vulnerable. So how is it looking now compared to where we were in March? Can you talk a little bit about where it stands? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things, uh, you know, one of the big things that's been challenging is for so many people realizing how long-term both the illness itself, will, the impacts that it will have on our society, but then also the kind of shutdown. Um, so, you know, in terms of kind of concrete changes that we're seeing, I think one big one has been that in the immediate um, time when COVID-19 was sweeping through the U.S. and many countries and there were shutdowns, we saw a lot of food wasted at that moment. And I think we have done some work and, and some good work in trying to make some transitions in the food supply. So things like um, distributors that primarily work with, with farmers selling to uh, restaurants and and hospitality sector have made 
some adjustments to try to get that food to retail. Policy has sort of allowed that to happen. We've seen response from USDA with things like the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. A big piece of that is paying distributors to purchase food from farmers that would otherwise be wasted and get it distributed through nonprofits to people in need. Um, but I think there's been some pervasive challenges that have continued to grow in the food system. Um, one of the big ones is just the, the continued high rates of COVID-19 illness amongst uh, farm workers, workers in, in food processing, particularly the meat sector and in grocery stores. And I think that these are, are problems that are going to uh, continue because we haven't really figured out how to address them yet. The impact on food, of course, is, is I mean, very much the, the kind of personal health impacts for those individuals and their families, but then also that these um, impact our ability to kind of bring food from production through to market. Um, so there's some, some things we're doing well, some things that are continuing to be problems. And I think that on the whole, the, the other big challenge is that at the same time that we're still seeing a lot of food wasted, the number of people who are facing food insecurity has gone up and up. Um, I saw some data that the number has gone from, uh, at the end of 2019 in the US, for example, we had about 11% of the population um, was food insecure. And now estimates put that as high as 38% of people saying that they're not sure if they're going to be able to provide their next meal or provide all the meals they need within the next few months. Um, and globally, the UN has reported that food insecurity and hunger might double due to COVID-19. Oh, wow. Those numbers are staggering. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, for all of these reasons, things shutting down, job loss, even as things begin to reopen. Um, and I think, you know, business owners see that reopening isn't necessarily bringing a flood of people in the door. We'll continue to see those, um, those layoffs and that impact. So we'll have some work to do, um, both in like, in terms of supporting, you know, social protection generally, um, and unemployment protection, et cetera, but um, quite specifically in the food system too. Absolutely. And then what are you seeing on the commercial food waste side? I know that that bottomed out. Is that coming back at all? I, I don't have great data on that yet. I mean, I think one of the challenges is that the reopening plans have been so spotty from, from you know, particularly domestically from place to place. So I think that there's still, to me, you know, big question mark and um, what we're seeing as far as um, where businesses are able to really kind of bring things back to capacity. Um, certainly with restaurants and, and other commercial enterprises, if there are density restrictions to try to reduce the number of people in buildings at any time, then, um, you know, I think it, it's, it's challenging for businesses when they know how to order for, uh, you know, to provide food for a certain number of customers and then not being able to really predict what that amount will be. I think we'll see that there's, even as things start to scale up, that there'll be like two steps forward, one step back. Definitely. And then you mentioned the farmers briefly, but have they fared better or worse than expected, you think? That's a tough question, actually. Um, I think the best way to answer oh. the question is that is that uh, farmers have just faced a lot of um, of challenges, both in terms of uh, you know, supply chains being down, um, even as things start to pick up again, I think it's really hard for farmers who have to start producing crops months before they need to be at market. Um, you know, I think that, that it, made, it made things really difficult and unpredictable for them. And then I think we're seeing even now a lot of outbreaks among farm workers. And I don't know where that will, will lead us, but, um, you know, if it ends up with shutdowns of, of farming operations or or, um, you know, needing to reduce the number of people in fields at given times. I think all of these things are really going to impact how much food ends up getting wasted in the fields and then ultimately kind of take home pay and, and you know, viability of farms. Definitely. And then, I mean, you've, you've talked a lot about food workers. Do you think COVID has helped show the world how important they are, even more so than, than we thought before? I think that's definitely true. Um, often workers in the food chain are just invisible. Um, you know, I think people don't think about where this food came from and what are all the, the 
you know, hands that that had to be working in the fields or in processing or in grocery store sh stocking shelves, this has become a lot more visible. Um, so far, I don't know that we've seen a real, um, besides it being visible and it being on people's radar, I don't think that we've seen uh, measurable changes that align with that, particularly at the federal level. Um, one of the issues that we've seen was really that um, OSHA, for example, within the Department of Labor, they, off, they are the ones that are called in to address worker safety and health challenges, and that there's been a huge increase in requests for OSHA to um, investigate reports, but that they've declined in many cases and haven't had the capacity to really investigate. So that's been disappointing. Um, and then I think a lot of people were talking about the executive order um, now several weeks back that the president put out um, asking USDA to ensure that food production, particularly meat processing, stays open. And I think that, that the way that that was framed was really about we need to keep processing plants open to maintain the food supply for the American consumers. You could have framed that a really different way. It could have been framed that we're, the president is giving the authority to the Department of Labor to ensure the safety of workers meaning that, you know, without safe and healthy workers, we can't continue to make sure that there is food. Um, so I think even the framing of that to me, you know, has put a lot of the um, the focus on consumers and not as much on the workers. So my hope is that now that more, uh, it's more in the public consciousness and more in the media that we'll see uh, policy change follow from that and that more Americans will push for that. But um, but so far, that I don't think that's what we've seen really in the policy decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. And then, do you think um, there'll be any long-term changes that stay as a result of the pandemic around food and policy and the food chain? Mm -hmm. This is the $50 million question. I think that changes will remain. I don't know yet what they will be. We've been, uh, on our own, we're doing a bunch of things to try to track those changes. So, we've um, posted on our website a, a tracker of state policies that we're, we're looking at on two different issues. One was really around the, the way that um, shutdown orders impacted and addressed food, uh, both you know, food production, food distribution, food banks, et cetera. Um, and then we also have been tracking state policies to get food to uh, vulnerable or marginalized households and individuals. So we're looking at those. Um, I think at the federal level, we've seen a lot of um, efforts on the part, particularly of USDA, to put in place different waivers that make it easy to uh, serve, you know, children in schools that have been closed or to um, increase um, SNAP enrollment. My hope is, and a lot of people are pushing for some of these to change and to be more permanent. Um, as one example, um, a lot of states have now gotten authorization from USDA to operate a program called Pandemic EBT, which allows schools to send uh, households with children a little card that they can use to purchase food at retail when schools close. So, you know, under the assumption that, and, the, you know, the fact that many children get a lot of their food each day from uh, school, when schools are closed, they need some funds to support them obtaining those meals. Uh, so there's been a big push to say, well, we could just send these cards out at the beginning of the year to all students. And then if there's closures due to the pandemic or even due to snow days or hurricanes or wildfires, then we don't have to, you know, worry that at that time children aren't receiving their meals. We can just automatically put funding onto those cards. So I think that they're, they're, that's a small example, but I do think that there will be some changes that come from this. Um, and I think there's a lot, uh, you know, us included, a lot of folks out there that are trying to figure out what those should be and what we should be pushing for, um, you know, to make uh, the food system more sound and more resilient. Definitely. And, and I hope a lot of good comes from that. And I also know that you work closely with a lot of the um, donation organizations and um, that you, you do a great job tracking data. How how are those organizations faring now, you know, that we're a few months in, like Feeding America yeah. and, and those those organizations, how are they doing? Yeah, so we, I think what we've seen at first, I mean, these organizations that are kind of on the front lines of trying to 
um, address this shifting landscape and the increased need, they are working so hard. I am in complete awe of the, you know, nonprofit organizations like Feeding America, like, you know, many of the kind of local partners we've worked with, um, Boston Area Gleaners, Daily Table, 412 Food Rescue, you know, et cetera, uh, are just working around the clock to try to um, meet the growing need on both the food waste and food recovery side and on the hunger and kind of food insecurity side. Um, one thing that we did is, is um, we conducted a survey with partners of ours at the Global Food Banking Network. And this is more at the national level, but we looked at across different countries um, they, we, we kind of collaborated with them to survey food bank networks, and they were able to survey food banks in 45 countries, and we were able to get a sense from that just how this looks globally. Um, so I can tell you a little bit from that, um, but I think what we saw, this maybe isn't that surprising, was that 100% of food banks globally reported a huge spike in demand since the outbreak of COVID-19. Half of the food banks said that they had a more than 50% increase in demand, and, and a third of them said that there was nearly a doubling of demand. Um, for example, Feeding America here in the U.S. said they had an increase, a 59% increase in demand for, um, for, you know, for provision of food, and 40% 40, 40 of the users that are now showing up to food banks and to their their pantries and soup kitchens and, you know, other um, agencies, 40% of those people who are showing up are using food bank services for the first time ever. So just to paint a picture of, you know, this, the, the, you know, the, the amount of change that we're seeing here in the U.S. and then how that compares globally. Um, the rest of that project, you know, went on to kind of make some suggestions of how governments are handling this well and can really partner effectively with food banks. Um, I think actually, Though there's a lot more we can do in this country, we found the U.S. is one of the strongest countries in terms of the the way that we we put in place things like increased money for the emergency food assistance program, and then also the coronavirus food assistance program, which is new, um, really to drive more food and more dollars to food banks and food recovery organizations. Well, that's good to hear, and I know there's a lot. A lot more work to do, and I know you'll be following. And, and I'm as impressed as you are with with these organizations. It's amazing, and and I hadn't heard those yeah. numbers before. So they're staggering that they've been able to keep up with that and and uh, keep keep people fed and and handle the food waste like they have. So I want to just um, tailor the the conversation a little bit now to climate change. Um, and I know that you did an award-winning project called Reducing Food Waste as a Key to Addressing Climate Change. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that work and, and, um, and your award and, and where that all stands now? Yeah, that funding was, it's actually a pretty amazing uh, grant program that Harvard University puts out. Um, it was, it was uh, a couple years ago now, I think we got the funding first about um, four or five years ago. The idea behind the, this grant is really to fund, um, to you know, see different initiatives and projects around Harvard University that have potential to translate academic work into real, um, either you know, inventions or developments or you know, network, whatever, like translate the research into practice and into real world impact. Um, so the funding that we got from that was actually the first funding that we ever had for the work we've done on food waste. And what it funded was like the, the, you know, a lot of the projects that you know about or that we talked about, but it was, it allowed us to scale up all of the things that we were doing um, domestically to really understand better the way that law and policy impacts food waste. So, for example, one of the big ways that we use that support has been work that we've done in um, states across the country to either provide um, you know, one piece of that work has been providing state agencies with guidance documents for businesses about how to donate food. Um, and we've done that now in more than a dozen states. We have them all on our website, but, you know, if you're in the most recent state we worked on was Michigan. So if you're in Michigan and you're a business that wants to donate, here's the liability protection that exists under federal law that you're eligible for, and then also what the specifics are of Michigan law. Um, Liability protection is a good example where 
there's amazing federal protection that's really intended to um, comfort and, and you know, provide an incentive for businesses to donate food. But states can even go above that and offer protection that may support different innovative models. So, um, you know, things like uh, supporting nonprofits that maybe have a, a nonprofit retail model where they sell donated food at a low price, um, those kinds of things. And then our work also was, uh, you know, here in Massachusetts, we work really closely with the Department of Environmental Protection. When Massachusetts first en enacted its organic waste ban, um, I think the state started getting a lot more questions about different methods of food recovery. So one of the areas was a lot more questions about compost and the rules and best practices for composting. Um, we weren't involved in that project, but the state worked with the Center for Ecotechnology to put out guidance on that. And then they started getting a lot of questions about donation and we partnered with them to help put out best practices that um, included both the, the legal side, but also just the, um, you know, what are the, the right ways to handle food for donation. So a lot of the funding went to support our ability to work hands-on with more states. Um, and then also with um, scaling up some of the work that we've been doing on um, uh, certainly on date labeling, which at the time that we first got the award, we had just done our initial research to show that uh, that you know date labels really were misleading and were leading to a lot of waste. But it really supported our ability to go deeper on what would it look like to have a better policy. And I'm working with industry on putting that out. So. I, I will really credit this funding from Harvard with um, allowing us to take a piece that had been a small area of our work and really scale it up to uh, all of the areas that we've been able to cover and work on now. Um, and the other, the other beyond the liability and, and, and date labels was uh, it, it supported our research and understanding about the tax incentives that are given to food donors, which was at that time a new area that we'd been wanting to get involved in, but it really helped us to uh, just have the support and look into all of these. We know that food waste is a huge contributor to climate change. The UN reported last year, the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported that uh, eight to 10% of global um, greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change come from food waste. So anything that we can do to make systems changes that reduce waste will have a beneficial impact on uh, our climate. Definitely. But you mentioned Massachusetts organic span. And, and um, do you think states are starting to put the infrastructure in place to be able to handle food waste properly? I know that that's been an issue because New Jersey just did this as well. And, and one of the biggest, well, a couple of issues that they mentioned, you know, one, education, right? And then number two is, you know, they don't really, they don't have the infrastructure to handle what's coming down the road through 2022. Right now they can, mm -hmm. but not based, not based on where it's going and, and what the law will do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing, we're definitely seeing more and more states and localities and enacting or you know starting the considerations of organic waste bans. I think most of them realize that uh, at the time that a piece of, that a, that a waste ban is passed, that they don't have the capacity to really handle that food waste, either whether it's through donation or through um, composting or anaerobic digestion. But the policy itself is, is a great way to kind of um, signal to industry that the state, that, that there's gonna be um, some market opportunity in that space. So I think that the idea it, for all of these states that have passed these is to start you know, a long runway, you know, two, three, four years between when the law is enacted and when there will actually be penalties for food waste. Um, and then in many cases, put, supply some of the seed funding for development of um, the facilities, like, you know, startup for AD facilities or things like that. So I think that's what we're seeing. I mean, it's an interesting time. I think in a lot of ways, COVID-19 has put a um, you know, damper on some of the, the movement we saw on organic waste bans or waste diversion requirements because there's just among the many things that are most front and center for people right now, I think that this ends up falling to the back. First, it's, um, you know, there's, there's obviously a big focus on getting food donated, but I think less on, you know, kind of going after people and, and, and putting penalties in place 
Um, also, as more people are working remotely, it makes it really difficult to do the inspections that would be needed to actually see if some of these laws are being properly implemented. So there's been a little bit of a slowdown, I think, on that space. But uh, I will say we put out a, a, a pretty lengthy toolkit last summer that was really about the ins and outs of all of the organic waste bans that we've seen in the U.S. Um, and it kind of describes what they entail, how they differ from one another, some of the best practices. And then we had some checklists in there for like what cities or states could actually do to, if they wanted to implement their own waste ban, here's the checklist for the considerations that you need to think about in terms of who's covered and who's exempt and what penalties you'll have and all of those things. So I hope is uh, because these policies have been really the most impactful and transformative, my hope is really that it will pick up again. But um, I think there's been a relaxation of sort of environmental penalties from at the federal level, certainly, and I think at all levels of government during COVID-19. One thing I want to mention, I, I don't know if you want to talk at all about our global food donation policy atlas that we um, that we just put out, but one of the areas we, we have been tracking also across countries now is, um, we're, you know, we're tracking six different areas of law. One of them is around waistbands and donation requirements. And what we saw was that most of the countries, it's, it's pretty rare still to have those at the federal level, but there's been more and more uptake of these in states and provinces. So in um, all of North America, really, we're seeing um, you know, municipal or provincial level organic waste bans or donation requirements. And I think we'll just continue to see that spread. I bet. And then is there anything else you want to share about that? So we launched, we have about, let's see, the last year and a half, we've been working with the Global Food Banking Network. Um, they approached us and, and asked us to help with analyzing and comparing laws on food donation across countries. And the genesis of this was really that as food donation is growing, as, as concerns about food waste are growing, um, there's obviously a lot of reasons that food is wasted. But one of the big ones is that policies and laws and the government, you know, government plays a really big role in how much food ends up going to waste versus being diverted. Um, so with the help of Global Food Banking Network, we selected 15 countries. We had a strong focus on um, Latin America, really, for the first few years, but then made sure that we're including at least one other country in, in you know, each region of the world. Um, and we just launched in June the website that has the, all of the materials and the map for the first five countries. Um, so that right now includes the U.S., Canada, Mexico, Argentina, and India. And what you can do on the website is um, – for each country, there's like a written legal guide, recommendations, and an executive summary that I think is probably a good starting point for any users of the site. Um, but there's also a map, and in the map, you can pick any of these areas of law that we, from our research, realized were really the key areas that impact whether food is donated or not. Um, so those are food safety laws around donation, date labeling rules, uh, liability protections for food donations, tax incentives or barriers. Um, in some countries, there's actually barriers in their tax law that make it costly to donate. Um, donation requirements or food waste penalties. And then lastly, uh, government grants or other government support of food donation. Um, and on the website, you can actually compare those. And we, we by now zooming out to across countries, we were able to really flag what are strong policies versus weak policies. Um, so you can use it to see which countries had some of the best policies on these um, and, and, and make some decisions about where, uh, where other countries can begin to learn or think about the laws that they have on the books. So it's been really exciting. We actually, I just was presenting on it today uh, and we've been getting this amazing feedback and um, I'm just really excited about the tool. Wow, that sounds amazing. I will make sure to put the website in the notes so that people can check out the Atlas on, on their own and on your site. That would be great. Perfect. That's great. Thank you. What an undertaking. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Yes. It's been amazing. It's been a lot of work, but, um, you know, I think we've 
I feel really lucky to be working on this because we've really learned so much. And over the few years, I've had not only myself and, you know, four different members of my staff, but we've had 20 students across the few years that have worked on some of the different country research and have gotten to go and travel and learn. And so it's, it's you know, it's been a big undertaking, but also I think has contributed to a lot of, of um, learning and knowledge that we're excited to share. Oh, that's great. And so rewarding. Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we're hearing more and more about upcycled food and um, we're friendly with the upcycled food association. And can you tell us your thoughts about that? And um, for people who don't know, are you able to explain what that is? I, one of the things we worked on this year that was been really interesting was we, we supported work of both the upcycled food association, but then also this kind of cross um, uh, organization task force. The idea behind it was really that as upcycled is growing, as um, it has become something that more, you know, consumers are learning about and knowing about and prioritizing, there's really an opportunity to define the term, um, both to make sure that, that businesses that are, that are advertising their product as upcycled are really, um, you know, using it in a not misleading way to help educate consumers and also coming again from my, my vantage point in law and policy to educate policymakers about the fact that this is a real opportunity. And um, so upcycled food really is a uh, food that has been either like surplus product that would otherwise be wasted often, um, you know, products that were imperfect or ugly produce that, would be wasted and instead we're finding a way to process them into something else or it could be the byproducts of food. And so I think, I don't know yet where this will go, but as an example, there's a group looking at, you know, eggshells, we don't eat them, we throw them away, but there's a lot of nutrients in there. Is there some way to process them that make them safe to consume, but also uses those nutrients and reduces food waste? So there's a lot of opportunity. It's like a, just a burgeoning area for innovation uh, and we were able to work on the definition, and I could tell you a couple highlights of it. We, in working on it, um, there was there's really a task force of of a bunch of different um, other nonprofit organizations and some industry, some folks from government, uh, and so we were able to really think about what the definition should look like. Um, one of the big pieces was, you know, I think we are we we intuitively know this, but that upcycled foods would be made from. Um, ingredients that otherwise would be wasted. And I think this piece is really important and will be important. Um, I know the Upcycle Food Association now is taking the first steps towards developing a certification for, um, you know, businesses that and products that want to claim that they are upcycled, but uh, making sure that it's not, it's not greenwashing. We're not putting this label on food that otherwise would have been sold anyway, but that it's really going on to ingredients that we know have been rescued from um, you know, getting going to the landfill or from being um, wasted in some other way. Um, upcycled foods, we really determined would be things that are value added. And this is because upcycling kind of comes from the term recycling, which, which connotes taking something and do, you know, changing it in some way to make it into uh, a new product. Um, so that these are products that are, that, that some uh, value has been added. They've been um, cooked or processed in some way to turn them into a new product that is an upcycling of their former selves. Um, we talked also about the upcycled foods, at least for now, having an auditable supply chain. I think over time with, with certification, this will be essential, but that uh, if you're claiming that your product is upcycled, making sure that there's some, um, you're tracking your supply chain to be able to show that along the way. And that if, for example, a consumer were to come back and say, I wanna see, you know, show me how this has been upcycled or, or you know, um, this seems unlikely, but potentially if there were a lawsuit where consumers said, I think you lied about this being upcycled, that you'd be able as a company to show that supply chain. Um, and then also, I think, you know, indicating which ingredients are the ones that are upcycled on a product. So, for example, um, most products will contain some ingredients that are upcycled, but will also contain other ingredients that are not, um, especially if they're being like cooked or processed in some way. Uh, so making that clear. But I, I think that it, I'm just so energized and excited. The Upcycled Food Association has already done so much to um, 
pull together and make a name for this growing field that, that I think has a lot of potential um, and, and will, I think from the definition and from the certification, there'll be a lot of future opportunities for, for businesses, for government, for consumers to, um, you know, use upcycle products to meet their own goals around, uh, around, you know, sustainability and climate, et cetera. It'll be exciting to watch. And I, I think you're right. I think it is going to lead to a lot of innovation and um, I, it's just so great to see this happening in the industry. Yeah. And they, they estimated that like the market for upcycled food is like $46 billion. I mean, you know, this is a sizable opportunity. So I think, um, and, and one that has social value. So it's all really exciting. That is exciting. And then, so Emily, what else should we be paying attention to? I mean, a lot of our listeners are um, in waste management and uh, recycling and, and they handle food waste. Is there anything that you'd like to see them pay attention to from your perspective? I, I would say, I mean, if anything, I think anyone working in any part of the food system right now is probably just seeing really rapid changes. Um, you know, I think things on my radar, we anticipate there's going to be some additional, I think at the, at the national level, some, um, you know, next version of the stimulus bills that have been passed throughout spring. So we've been spending some time focused on what are opportunities there. In the food waste space, um, we focused on um, trying to get some uh, changes on the margins to the, the uh, liability protection, just to make it easier to protect the types of food donation that we're seeing during the pandemic. And then we've also been pushing for some um, additions to the tax incentive for food donations. Uh, most notably one um, to create a, a tax incentive that's better suited to farmers. Um, because we often hear that farmers are find it very difficult to claim the federal deduction that they can get for donating food. And then the other piece that we're pushing for is a tax benefit that would be for um, companies that are involved in the logistics and transportation of getting food waste from point A to point B. Um, so those are things to kind of have on the radar. And then I think whatever else comes out of that will undoubtedly end up addressing some of the things we're hearing about in the food system, whether from the kind of food security, um, SNAP and, and food assistance side to the farmer support side. I think the other thing that's important and, you know, I, have been trying to take time for this now is remembering that um, just that this is going to be a marathon. And I think, um, you know, uh, taking the long view of um, both, you know, your, our own kind of personal health and, 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 and how much we can be working full time right now, just trying to understand and respond to all of these inputs. Um, but also that there's, I think going to be opportunities in the coming months as well to give, for those with expertise in different parts of the food system uh, to give input on what this looks like and what that long view should look like. We have been revitalizing work that we did a few years ago, also on pushing for the U.S. to create a, na a coordinated national food strategy. And I think, you know, we've seen lots of other countries do things like this prior to COVID. Some countries are starting to create ones because of the response to the pandemic. Um, but I think if something like that were to come about in the U.S., our hope and the vision that we're pushing is that it would be a way to coordinate agencies across the government, but really, even more importantly, to provide ways for um, stakeholders throughout the food system to give input to government on what it looks like on the ground to be um, transporting food and handling food and seeing the waste and, and, and you know, help use all of that greater participatory process to drive better policy. So that's something I hope that we'll see. And we'll be putting out a report on that this fall as well, kind of in the lead up to the election. Oh, that's great. Well, we'd love to, to get a hold of that when you do that. That sounds really interesting. We'd love to follow that. Thank you. I'd love that. Well, Emily, this has been such an awesome conversation. You're so insightful. And I think our listeners will get a lot out of this. Thank you for spending so much time with us. For sure. I feel like I was so long winded. So like reiterating again, if there's anything that was super long winded that you want to cut down in any way, or if you listen to it and it's like, you know, you need me to do any 
any modification, let me know. Um, it was fun. I love talking about this stuff. I feel like I could go on and on, and so I have to rein myself in. So thanks for letting me pontificate about all of this. Oh, I, no, I love it. I love to hear your passion, and um, I love how you cover so many areas beyond even, you know, your legal perspective. It's super helpful, and, and I felt like I even learned a lot. So thank you so much. And please stay well, and, and um, I wish you and, and your students luck and, and your family, too. Everybody stay well. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Okay. You too. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Emily. Bye-bye. <laughs>